there's any advice for people who are setting out on this is everybody is a potential friend and a contact and they will benefit from talking to you and you can benefit from talking to them. Hello there, I'm Sarah McCluskey and this is Research Adjacent. Each episode, I talk to amazing research adjacent professionals about what they do and why it makes a difference. Keep listening to find out why we think the research adjacent space is where the real magic happens. For this episode, I had the absolute pleasure of talking to Simon Cutler. I feel like I could have had Simon on for multiple podcast episodes as he has had so many research adjacent jobs over the years. He started as an actual researcher, but in his own words, the poacher turned gamekeeper and he went to work for research funders BBSRC. But now he's jumped back over the fence and is working in enterprise commercialisation and business relationships at the University of Reading. The main thing I got from talking to Simon is just how much he loves connecting with people and the way that his conversations with anyone and everyone will spark off a million ideas. Listen on to see if you can soak up some of his energy and enthusiasm. Welcome along, Simon. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. An absolute pleasure. Really nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I wonder if we could begin by you telling us a bit about what it is that you do. Uh, so I, I mean, I've really enjoyed listening to your, your your podcasts to date. I think there's there's always similarities with some of the careers that you hear about, but everyone's unique. And I'd like to think I've had a fairly unique experience. But I currently work at, at the University of Reading as a business relationship manager. And that sounds very well well defined, but actually it's a very broad church, uh, quite, quite difficult to, to explain succinctly exactly what it is that you can get involved in. Actually, that's one of the appeals really of, of the role. But in, in the simplest form, it's really trying to make sure that the academic researchers at the university engage appropriately with external organisations and in a lot of the, the, the cases for my particular role that's with businesses small or large but we also have a, a, a broader role in encouraging uh, knowledge exchange so making sure that that we have real world impact from the research that's often publicly funded um, and that where appropriate uh, we encourage and support commercialization. Of, of of research activity and that's often you know one of the best ways to to, to make sure that the research gets out there um, but it can be everything and, and anything from um, training um, researchers particularly early career researchers which is a particular passion of mine to sourcing companies for academics to work with working on funding applications and, and all sorts of activities and we we can delve into some of those, I, I suppose, but it can be anything and everything, really. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. I looked when I looked at your job title. Your official job title is the Prosperity and Resilience Lead. So that sounds. I've never seen that in a job title before. Well, well, I, I work really closely with one of our research deans. The university is split into into four research themes, including the environment, which is a bit a big area for, for the university, agriculture, food, and health. Heritage and creativity, and you're, you're right, I, I fall within the prosperity and resilience theme. And the research dean himself has a bit of fun with this one, because what would you call a theme that covers everything from Henley Business School to Institute of Education to Department of Economics, Global Research and so on? It, it's a very broad theme, but actually it has no bearing on my own research training. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I suppose one of the the, the potential topics uh, or, or titles for this podcast was was gamekeeper turned poacher or poacher turned gamekeeper so I've ended up being trained in one area and then found myself in a very different area but but the prosperity and res- resilience theme is, is is very broad but in in a nutshell it's probably mainly the social science element of the research that the the university undertakes yeah no I think it's really interesting the words and the language that we choose to describe things so uh, yeah that was a new one on me but yeah, you you hinted a bit there about your journey into this work. So you said gamekeeper turned poacher, vice versa. Tell us a bit about that. How have you ended up here? Okay, so so my career, as as many uh, individuals in 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 this sort of space, started with 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 very little planning and just taking the opportunities that were thrown <laughs> at me, and that started many many years ago. And I and and 
I, I, my career started, I went down the medicine route. So I, I studied medicine for a year uh, at Leeds. And that was always what I wanted to do from, from, from school. It didn't take much thinking about. I loved the sciences. I could see myself, you know, working as a, a GP or a hospital doctor. You know, it was never in question until I started studying medicine. And it's it's a hard slog. And it just wasn't for me, ultimately. And at the end of a year, I realised it wasn't for me. And I think at that stage, it was a brave decision. I, I decided to, to, to move while I could. And I, I uh, went to the University of Birmingham and studied biological sciences. And I suppose I've never really looked back since then. Mm -hmm. That's passion. Got to the end of an undergraduate degree and again looked around and thought, well, what do I do next? And a PhD uh, was, was offered to me. And I had not really thought much about it. It was in fungal genetics, fungal molecular biology. So I, I followed on with a PhD. And I think that was the very best decision I ever did, a bit of time to sort of grow, learn a little bit about myself and to meet some fantastic people, one of which ended up my wife, at, at, you know, and some really good friends in that space. So it was, a, it was a very happy time. But again, all that training comes to an end. And and after two two years, eight months, actually, I wasn't a particularly stellar student, but but I, I was on a, a three-year studentship and in those days, we didn't get funded to, to write up. So yeah. I took on a postdoc position working on the button mushroom, would you believe it, at a research institute. So we were firing gold particles covered in DNA, trying to genetically transform button mushrooms at a research institute in the Midlands. And I was writing up at the same time. And so you mm -hmm. learn about, about yourself. That was a difficult period. And at the end of that, I moved on to another postdoc position without really thinking a great deal about it. But in that instance, working with two agrochemicals companies, and I think that was probably the point where I realised there was a little bit more to life than, than the academic life. And that actually application of, of, of research was, was of, of interest. And again, at the end of that, your academic career, you look at it, most people don't end up going down that academic career. And it's something that I talk to students now. There's the, the, it's not to say that the academic career isn't one that should be valued, absolutely. But equally, we should value all the other yeah. opportunities that, that we get. And there's a great study. The Royal Society did something called the Scientific Century in 2010, which, which I always put up on careers talks to students. It's still very valuable now. There's a graphic in it which shows where people end up. And most people don't end up in an academic career. There's a, a very tiny percentage that end up as professors. And so, you know, you recognise that everything else has as much value. And I ended up then at the end of that postdoc equipped with a lot of, of, of skills, but looking for a home. And I applied for a position at the research councils mm -hmm. as a programme manager. And that was really, I suppose, the start of a, of a formal career that wasn't academic. And I stayed there for 16 years, a, a, a long, happy time. I made a lot of contacts, but I moved around various different positions from a programme manager supporting uh, the peer review process, managing some really large um, genomics programmes across the UK. And uh, that was really interesting. I moved through to a chief exec executive office as a affectionately known as a bag carrier. So followed <laughs> um, the, the chief executive around and learned all about everything else that went on in, in, in public support of research. And then ultimately, I found my way into a business innovation uh, unit at that stage. And that was really, again, building on some of the earlier experience in, in a, in a postdoc funded by, by industry and operating in that space to, 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 to develop programs and schemes to enable and business people to move into academia and vice versa and to train students. There's a wonderful program called the Young Entrepreneur Scheme, which I've been involved in for nearly all of the 28 years that it's been around now. And I used to fund and support that, support so many students and postdocs going through that program, highlighting how they might engage with industry and academia. And then, my, you know, towards the end of the time at the research councils, I worked in skills and careers myself uh, and developed uh, some of the first doctoral training partnership programmes at the councils and other ones in collaboration with industry. So, again, it was a real 
a real privilege to be involved in some of those large activities that that really uh, were were funding fundamental research and training you know the the researchers of of, of tomorrow um and then just to complete the story um after those 16 years i i wanted to get a bit closer to home i was fed up with commuting all the way out to swindon um you know it, it wears you down after a little while i lived at sort of reading direction and an opportunity arose in the knowledge transfer center to take on um, this current position um and i you know it, 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 i wouldn't say it's been a, a, an easy ride trying to to navigate this type of business relationship activity at a university it's still something that you know there's a lot of work to be done to to try to educate encourage stimulate activity in this area but i think i think that battle is being won slowly but surely and and that's where where i've been for the last 6 years and you know we can talk a little bit more about that role if that's of interest to you but everything and anything like i say it does sound like you've you've done a lot of stuff yeah so how has it been going through that transition from being the person who receives the funding then to being the funder then back to being the people who receive the funding again well that's the gamekeeper turned poacher yeah. bit really, isn't it? and i think it's a feature of, of my career moving from biological sciences to social sciences where i'm supporting it and and as you you rightly say, being on the other side of the the, the fence when it comes to funding, I, I think the, the the thing to recognise is I I never saw that. Uh, it depends who you see as the customer, mm-hmm. and you know whether it's the researcher or the or the funder, and and so you can turn that round in your head a little bit. And I always saw myself, you know, wherever I was as as the customer, either you know looking for the best research to fund. Or, or or being on the other side of that coin trying to to access funding uh, and a variety of different types of funding so so I don't do the research myself now but and, and that that's actually in some some ways quite a relief because it's hard work <laughs> yeah. um, it really is hard work but you get to meet some incredible uh, academic researchers you know who really are leading lights whether it's in you know stem based subjects that mm-hmm. I was involved originally or i think there's a coin been termed now shape social yeah. science humanities and arts for people in the economy and i think one of your previous podcasts talked about the aspect program which i've um, been involved in as well um which is really trying to encourage you know commercialization of work in in that area but so so you end up thinking a little bit differently but what what i always took for granted particularly at the research council was, was just the network that i'd built mm-hmm. up because like you, I, I really do quite enjoy talking to people, meeting new people. Yeah. Um, and and that, that's been one of the the drivers for the types of work that I've done. You know, give me an opportunity to go out there and talk to somebody. And I'll, yeah, yes, please. And I do my thing aloud. I'm a, an, an extrovert. I'm, I think if you did MBTI personality type, I'm I'm very much extroverted. So yeah. I get my, my, my son reminded me this the other day. He said, you know, as he and I are extroverts, my, my wife and my other lad are are introverts he said you start the day empty and then you mm-hmm. fill your credits up during the day by talking to people and and he said but other people who are introverts start their day full <laughs> by the end of the day they're empty yeah. um, so so my network I think was something that I never really realized that I'd built up because I'd had so many interactions over the years with some fascinating people and I just stayed in touch with them and you never want to exploit that so it always has to be two-way beneficial so the people that I worked with who were still at the research councils I'd maintain those connections and so was able to bring some very interesting people in to talk to our researchers and that that that's been very valuable equally so from the from the business side there's some incredible people small and large companies but the program I mentioned to you before then we've stayed engaged there and been able to expose our students to the likes of, and I'll, I will name check some because mm-hmm. there's some really interesting companies. GSK have been involved in in some of the programs. Syngenta is now chemicals. Mondelez and a company called RSSL, which is based on our campus, which looks at contract research, and every sort of opportunity with small fledgling companies that are just starting out that you can put those individuals in touch with researchers. Often through programs, again, I think you've been mentioned on your podcast, Knowledge Transfer Partnerships is one yeah. of the, the government flagship programs that we've supported businesses through. And there's a couple of those which I've been involved in with, with local fintech companies and hedge funds, which I never thought as a biologist that I would be engaging with. But but 
I think that's the benefit of, of having built up that network. So if there's any advice for people who are setting out on this is everybody is, is, is a potential friend and a contact and they will benefit from talking to you and you can benefit from talking to them. So use LinkedIn and make sure that you maintain those contacts. And, and, and there was always a piece of advice. Somebody gave it to me many years ago. It was more difficult during lockdown, you know, when we were just relying on these types of meetings, but you can still do it. But particularly with, with face-to-face meetings, just stick around at the end. Yeah. Um, and and it, invariably, there's lots of interesting people of all sorts of, of, of positions within organisations. And it's it's often a lot easier to talk to people than get to know them a little bit. And and, and as I say, make, make sure you, you connect with them afterwards. And, you know, in that respect, what we've been able to bring to the university, I'll give you two examples that we brought in is there's a Royal Society programme called the Entrepreneur in Residence programme, mm-hmm. which is a really fantastic programme and it supports, say, a day a week for, for an individual to come and work uh, at the university. And we've brought a couple of these into the university in different areas. One in our School of, of Food, Chemistry and Pharmacy, Bill Kogallan, so he had a lot of experience in the medical technologies area. So you know, he's re- really opened the eyes of some of our researchers who are looking to spin out some ideas. And latterly, a really powerful individual. You should, you should get onto one of these podcasts. Mm, yeah. She was one of the BBC's women in innovation called Fiona Marston. And, and she's working with us now on a partnership with the Royal Barks Hospital. And again, that was through connections that we've had at the research councils, she's locally based came along to our doctoral research conference and and is just interested in in working with and changing the way that that our academic researchers think and and they come with incredible expertise so i think if you consider yourself as 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 being able to i mean my role is business relationships so if you can open up some of those relationships and draw in a network that 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 can affect change in a very positive way at, at, at a university that's open to business, um, then I think you you can make a, a lot of very positive changes. So I think yeah, I went- <laughs> roundabout, but yeah, so many points. That's really fantastic, and it really sounds like you've found yourself in a place where both your natural strengths. And also, as you say, that those years of experience, all those different relationships you've got, people that you know from all sorts of different places, they all seem to really be coming together in this role that you're in now. Yes, I, I think I think that that's true. And I think you can't necessarily plan that out. So, no. so I, I do a lot of my I mean, my colleagues will, will, will comment on this. It's really it's important to recognise that you're part of, of a bigger machine. And you're a small cog in, in that machine, but you all have something to, to to give. So I've always been quite, quite happy to recognize that there's certain things that I don't do quite as well as other people. <laughs> you know, writing the grant applications isn't my biggest strength. I can see those applications. I can pull them together. But I do a lot of my thinking by talking, as mm-hmm. you can imagine. So but but that that skill set can be deployed in a, in a different way in terms of of, of drawing those in I, I still have to write applications and, and and the likes but it's it's something that I don't necessarily thrive on but but a good team recognizes that there's all sorts of individuals within that team who bring something different to the party and and I suppose it, it's a lesson that I've learned not only you know you know in my work environment and through say the program I mentioned before the yes program we bring teams together mm-hmm. and it would be very easy to pick the loud extroverted individuals like myself out and put them in leading positions so you're the leader and off you go but but what what I found over the years is that it's often the quieter more thoughtful ones who sit in the background absorb everything um that often make you know some of the best leaders um in some of those teams and I've seen that externally as well so one of the one of the real pleasures of working at a university it really works for me um, is being able and being encouraged to do some more volunteering activities. Um, so I'm a school governor. I've done that for about five or six years. And I've just I've actually just finished my last under 18s football team. You know, and what you see 
in those environments you wouldn't think you could translate into anything work-wise but it's the same it's the same thing it's the quieter ones who don't necessarily stand out at, 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 at an early training session turn out to be the superstars who are scoring or saving goals if you want to continue the metaphor yeah. um, and in fact even that sort of activity has been useful we we pulled together an application a number of years back for an ESRC center which was focusing on football right uh, yeah but it wasn't supported ultimately e- ESRC's loss i must admit but 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 sport can be transformational and what Absolutely. was really what was really nice in that 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 uh, the, the chance there was to pull all the players together from the FA to local footballing associations to ones associated with mental health and so on and and bring them to bear on the sorts of research that was going on in our prosperity and resilience theme yeah. and we work closely with uh, research development managers so we talk about a team again the research deans um, and also impact managers uh, and contracts managers so uh, at Reading we're, we're, we're organized within a professional services environment mm-hmm. we work to support our individual themes at the moment so there's always individuals who add something different um, and complement each other and I think it's always worth worth recognizing particularly when you're looking at career paths um that you can take a detour at any point you have to yeah. drive a lot of it yourself um you, somebody won't always lay out a, a, a big red welcome mat and say this is the way to your next career um, opportunity but at universities what i've always found is there is there are opportunities to shape new roles to take on different responsibilities to get involved so for instance even though i'm a business relationship manager i will get involved in graduation uh, ceremonies which is really you know a really happy day yeah uh, you know there's there's never a sad face around on a graduation day clearing you know for instance so get on the the, the switchboard helping out you know a level students who haven't quite made the mark and there's always somewhere for them to go to so you can get involved in that we've just had our first community festival at the mm-hmm. university you know, it's not been possible during lockdowns but it was great to turn up and be part of that community. So, so even though my career is in has found its way into this business relationship manager role, the university is a massive employer, and, yeah. and so it's opened up many many other avenues which I wouldn't have really considered. Um, yeah, really. it sounds like you're somebody who's always got your eyes open for you know connections and ideas and things like that coming all the time. But I think it's it's great advice. To, for for anybody who doesn't quite know what direction to go to just get out there talk to people try lots of different things and just see you know see what works for you and and know that there's lots of different paths uh, yeah. depending on your strength and your skills and that sort of thing yeah just dive in and I'm not somebody who goes looking for change I mean I've stayed you know with similar organizations for many years but I've always I've always moved around within those organisations. Otherwise, you'd, you'd get a little bit bored. So so I, I don't go looking for... I've not got a portfolio career like, you know, many of, of the individuals that are out there now sort of have a, a year here or two years mm-hmm. there, or whatever. I like I like to be grounded to an extent and, and and know the people around me. Yeah. And get to know new new people. But but I think the, the advice really is, is, is just to dive in, to recognise that that change is always going to happen. You know, and, and and I think I I fought that for a while because I was very happy at, at in my time at BVSRC at the research councils, you know. But things change. There are big government yeah. reviews which which change. I mean, being part at arm's length from from government policy, but from that, that the beast, the behemoth that is is government, was in itself an eye opener. And 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 you know, at the snap of a finger, everything could change. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of colleagues who who are part of UKRI now. Who are und- who are still undergoing a lot of change after after you know those councils were all put together a number of years back. But I think that training that 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 I received, you know, not only during my academic career, particularly postdocs mm-hmm. and PhD, and then subsequently at the research councils, really you know did did create a bedrock to to, to build on. But I think I always took the you know the opportunities that were thrown at me. So. Don't overplan. I mean that. that yeah. I mean, 
the, that's why these podcasts are really good. Don't think, well, I will end up doing that that yeah. position, but just follow your nose and and get some good advice. You know, speak to mentors, and as I say, just you know that role might come up at the right time for you to go go to. But yeah. there's always opportunities. There are always opportunities. Such good advice. Thank you. Are there? You've talked quite a bit there about some of the various projects and things like that, and people that you've worked with. Is there anything else that you're particularly proud of that you would like to tell us about? Well, I think I've probably covered a lot of them. Yes. I, th- I think that the, the one, either I've followed it or it's followed me, but that, that programme which I mentioned, the Young Entrepreneur Scheme, is one that, that I'm particularly proud of my association with. Um, and it's a great group at the University of Nottingham who managed that years back, you know, very much ahead of the curve, recognizing that the training early career researchers they've got they're getting really young now because it's not really as diverse it should be for everybody <laughs> so but it would always be known as the young entrepreneur scheme to me but it really was ahead of its time 28 years ago and there's mm-hmm. about six and a half thousand individuals who've gone through that training including myself you know and winning teams from from reading in the past that have gone through it and and what i think was good about it is in a very safe environment it allows researchers to dip their toe into um, the commercial world and recognise it's not as scary as, as everybody really thinks and that a spreadsheet profit and loss account, for instance, is quite useful to understand how it works and really just to understand the way that that, that funding is so vitally important to get many um, new ideas out there and making a difference. And and what, what was really pleasing with that is, that is although it still receives funding from a number of research councils, I think MRC, NERC and BBSRC still fund it. But it got buy-in from the big players I've mentioned before, mm-hmm. GSK, Mondelez and Syngenta. And so many people give up their time to, to make it happen, from patent attorneys to investors um, to people like myself. And really for the benefit of, of those those teams that go through it, postdocs, postgrads and technicians, many of whom will return to their life in in academia and maybe just think a little bit differently about what they do some of whom are absolutely inspired to do this for themselves and and what's been nice is it it really tracks my career from when I funded it Mm -hmm. councils to be on the other side of the coin and and just supporting teams at Reading to go through and we've taken even just at Reading we've taken in the past four or five years about 70 student teams through and and it really is one of the favourite parts of the job because the individuals are sponges and yeah. they're, they're not cynical <laughs> and untrusting and they just dive in. And you, yeah. you can learn a lot from from those, those energy-filled individuals. So I yeah. find it real tonic each year to, to, to pull the teams together and work with some real champions at the university. So if I'm if there's anything that I'm really proud of, it's my involvement in that and, and yeah. helping that to, to stay afloat and to prosper over. So oh, it sounds brilliant. We'll need to get a link to, to it and put it in the show notes that would be so great. people can no, find out more about it. Yeah. yeah. It's recruiting now. So, you know, yeah, please do. So and, and the, another thing that I'm really proud of, which really plays to that, you know, GameCube return poacher sort of something I never thought I'd be doing. I've I've had the pleasure of working with some of the academics within our prosperity and resilience theme at Hendy Business School. One of the the, the professors there called Norbert Marowitz, who's one of the leading lights at the university in terms of developing through that aspect network I mentioned earlier, a new angel investment network. And this is, is a syndication of investors who put money into new shape ventures. So there's a lot of money that goes into STEM. There's not so much uh, focus uh, on shape. But when you look at the types of companies that are out there, that are social sciences driven, human behavior driven, and so on, where where investment can make a massive difference, um, then that's one really great example. And, and what I've been able to do is work with the Aspect Network. Um, they've been really very supportive here in terms of funding and otherwise, we've got a great uh, network manager, Chris Rees, and marketing expert Donna Walton, who work on that 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 project. But I suppose the, the reason I'm really proud of that is 
it was my involvement that that enabled certain certain investments to be realized and and for that network to get off the ground so we've just launched that network and it's really really exciting to see you know where where that will go so an, an, another example of where you'd never expect a, a biologist uh, to be working you know within that social science frame on a on a big ESRC research england funded program so yeah all sorts of opportunities fantastic well i think we should start to think about wrapping up our conversation i'm sure we could have kept going for hours but uh how if anybody wants to get in touch with you how can they find you uh, drop me a linkedin uh message uh yeah. simon cutler university of reading uh and there's contact details through there i'm very happy to chat to people Brilliant. We'll get a link to the link to your profile and put it in the show notes as well then. So it just remains to say thank you so much for coming along to chat today. It's been a really pleasure talking to you. Likewise, and, and keep up the good work with uh, the podcast. It's really important to highlight the many, many people that work behind the scenes making research and research impact happen. So thank you so much for the job you're doing, Sarah. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for listening to Research Adjacent. If you're listening in a podcast app, please check you're subscribed and then use the links under the episode to find full show notes and to follow the podcast on LinkedIn, Twitter or Instagram. Also, make sure that you're subscribed to the Research Adjacent Roundup newsletter. You can also find all the links and other episodes at www.researchadjacent.com. Research Adjacent is presented and produced by Sarah McCluskey and you, yes you, get a big gold star for listening right to the end. See you next time.